science of the college. Uh, he graduated uh, with a degree in wood products and engineering, and he's had a long and distinguished career uh, starting in New York City at U.S. Plywood and eventually founding his own business, Dale Travis Associates Incorporated, which produces fine ar architectural signage. Uh, his company has worked with some of the most renowned architects and graphic designers in the world, and signs that they've created are displayed in and on buildings and museums across the country. We are especially appreciative of Dale and Sigrid being able to join us this evening. So if you all could, please join me with a round of applause for Dale and his contributions that have allowed us to have this event. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker uh, for this evening, uh, Dr. Timothy Volk. So Dr. Volk is a senior research associate uh, in the Department of Forest and Natural Resources. Right? He has more than 25 years of experience working in the fields of forestry, agroforestry, uh, short rotation woody crops, bioenergy, and phytoremediation. So really all over the place. And over the past 20 years, Dr. Volk has literally collaborated with colleagues in every single department on our campus. I believe he may be the only person on our campus who's collaborated with literally every department on the campus. And his research projects and proposals um, have generated over $15 million in direct funding for his research. He has worked with partners in the private sector and industry, government, and NGOs, right? So he has a very multi-dimensional research program. He, this program has enabled him to support a large number of graduate students throughout his career. He's mentored 11 PhD students, 14 master's students, two MPS students, and two postdoctoral researchers. In addition to this, he has a large team with 11 research scientists or technicians as well as a number of visiting international students and scientists who come to work with him on his projects. He and his group have written and co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed publications and numerous other uh, technical reports as well as white papers and other information uh, that's informed policy uh, throughout the state. So <coughs> Tonight, Dr. Volk is going to enlighten us with his lecture on Shrub Willow, a prescription for a healthier planet. Please join me in welcoming this year's Dale L. Travis speaker, Dr. Timothy Volk. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming and uh, spending time this evening uh, to learn a little bit about Willow. Uh, it's truly an honor to be asked to give this lecture. When I look at the people that have done this uh, previously, uh, it's uh, a, an impressive uh, group of individuals, uh, and so it really is an honor to come and uh, be able to share with you this evening. So what I want to do this evening is talk to you about Willow. As people know, <clears throat> I can talk about Willow for quite a while, but We'll try and keep it within the time frame uh, allocated. Basically, I want to do a few things uh, this evening. I'm going to talk about biomass. Uh, I want to put this in willow in context. So I want to start with talking about biomass, where it fits into renewable energy supplies in the world and in the United States. And then we'll focus in and talk about willow as another potential source of biomass uh, to feed into these systems going forward. I picked a few things out of uh, the work that's been going on for over 30 years here at ESF uh, related to the Willow project. And so I'll outline the production system, what we've done in terms of trying to expand the system across the landscape. I'll talk briefly about yield. It's really a key factor in terms of driving economics and environmental uh, assessments and sustainability of this system. It's important to do that. I'm going to pick out greenhouse gas balances and just highlight that briefly because it's an important driver still in the system. And if we're going to address, address climate change going forward, it's important to understand those dynamics in these systems. 
And then I'm going to shift and talk about a few things that we've done with Willow that are outside of the energy realm. We've taken what we've learned about Willow and applied it to what we call multifunctional systems. These systems provide some other primary benefit. Energy can also be a benefit that comes out of it, but they're often designed and implemented for some other particular uh, purpose. And I'll talk about a couple of examples of projects that we've worked on here, living snow fences and the remediation of a former industrial site here in the Syracuse area. So if we look at the worldwide energy supply, about 18% of all the energy consumed around the world comes from renewables. And as you can see on this graph, uh, it's 50% of all the renewables that are consumed come from biomass. Now typically when we talk about renewables or when you hear about it in the press, people talk about wind and solar. And those things are important. We need all of uh, the potential sources of renewable energy. Biomass is often left off, but it is actually the largest single source of renewable energy around the world. An IEA report that was just released recently called it the overlooked giant of renewables. The IPCC report that came out just a couple of weeks ago talked about how we're going to need to grow the use of biomass if we're going to address the issue of climate change, particularly in the areas of heating and transportation fuels. There's lots of other options for electricity, but those two fields are harder to get that, uh, to get electricity into as a source. And so transportation fuels and heating are two areas that we need to address, and biomass has huge potential uh, to address those directly. Here's the situation in the United States. Something similar, a little bit different. As you can see here, only 11% of the energy consumed in the United States comes from renewables, so we're below the world uh, average on that number. But if you look at where our renewables come from, we have a very similar pattern, and fully 45% of the renewables that we consume here in the United States come from biomass. Again, not something that's often on the front of a newspaper article or a radio story when you hear about renewables. But they're embedded in our uh, economic system and they're used widely. And that's projected to grow going forward. I just want to stop and talk about, so what is biomass, right? We use that term, I certainly use that term all the time, and let me give you a couple of perspectives on how to look at biomass. The first one is to think about it as so stored solar energy. Really, uh, what is occurring on the landscape is plants through photosynthesis are taking the sun's energy and through a fairly complicated process, building these chemical uh, compounds and bonds within the plant. That's where the energy comes from to drive the system. And so you can think about these uh, biomass systems across the landscape as just that. Batteries on the landscape collecting solar energy, storing it, and then you go harvest it and make use of it when you want to. The, down below that is a more, slightly more technical, although I, I will tell you that there are definitions of the biomass that run to two to three pages in legislation. It's not an easy thing to determine, but I think this has the key component. So it's recently produced organic uh, matter from plants, and then at the bottom, the key there, that it is uh, available on a renewable or occurring basis. So the time frame is important. Fossil fuels, may be, we may be generating oil somewhere around the world, but it takes millions of years. That's not available on a renewable or occurring basis. When we talk about biomass and the plant matter that we use, it can be grown in a relatively short period of time after it's harvested and used and regenerated. So those are the key components about biomass uh, and a couple of ways to think about it. What's the future biomass supply look like here in the United States? So this has been a focus of study now for a decade with the Department of Energy and the Department of Agriculture. They've down, now done three of these reports. The latest one published in 2016 is shown here on the screen. And really the question in this last report that they looked at was what is the potential economic availability of biomass resources now? And they projected out to 2040. Okay, so lots of modeling uh, involved in these uh, lots of assumptions go into this, but I'm just going to give you a snapshot of why I think this is important and to put Willow into context. The answer out of this, and has been consistent over a number of different studies, is that the United States can produce well over 1 billion tons of biomass per year in a sustainable manner. And there's a whole set of parameters. It's a whole other discussion to talk about how they frame sustainability in these reports. But they set a bunch of benchmarks and frameworks to do that and make it happen. So what does a billion tons of biomass do in the economy? What does it look like? What are the kind of impacts? It's a big number. It's not something that is easy to wrap your mind around. 
So here's a set of metrics that have been generated around biomass. So if we were to produce a billion tons of biomass every year in the United States and put that into renewable energy systems largely or also produce some bioproducts out of it, what would we get? Well, projections are we generate over 1.1 million direct jobs, right? There'd be millions and millions of indirect jobs that are related to that expansion that occurs across the landscape. We could replace 25% of our liquid transportation fuels. So transportation fuels in airplanes, trucks, cars, boats, trains. That's a substantial proportion of our transportation uh, fuel supply that's based on fossil fuels. And finally, the last one over here, up oh, things slipped a little, 450 million tons of CO2 could be reduced going, uh, emit, reduction in emissions going to the atmosphere. That's about 8.5% of the current emissions from the United States. So biomass is not going to solve our problems related to climate change, right? Uh, colleagues have used this phrase a lot over the years. It's, the solution to climate change is silver buckshot, not a silver bullet. So biomass is not the solution. It's part of the solution. And it's one that I think we need to spend some time uh, focusing on going forward. Of course, I'd be telling you that. But I'm just here to say that it, it's an important piece. And again, the IPCC report that just came out highlighted the need to focus on building out sustainable biomass systems. So where's that biomass coming from? Where are we going to generate another billion tons of biomass a year in the United States? Here's, here's one of the scenarios. Again, there's lots of scenarios. What you have here along the x-axis is from 2017 out to 2040. Okay, so time. And here's billion dry tons per year of biomass. You can see these categories at the bottom. What is currently used? And the model runs out that we're going to continue to use the biomass that we're moving through our food and forestry and other systems. Wastes is the next category. Not a lot of growth uh, here potential either. There, there is a little bit of potential, but not huge. Likewise with forest residues, not a lot of projected potential. The growth is really going to come from some growth in collecting and using agricultural residues. Think of wheat straw, corn stover, those kind of things. The big growth is coming here in energy crops. So in this model run, 736 million dry tons a year from energy crops. If you look at it now, there's not enough energy crops producing biomass on the landscape to make it on this graph, okay? So in some ways, this is exciting. I tell students, if we were actually going to do this, this is job security for lots of people, right? For me, for the rest of the career, and anybody else who wants to get into the biomass world. It would take tens of millions of acres to make this happen across the landscape. So what are energy crops? Well, here are the key energy crops that the Department of Energy highlights in this analysis. There's herbaceous energy crops, and those are the biggest ones because we have lots of land. Think of the prairies where we can grow herbaceous crops where woody crops are not going to grow. So the top two, switchgrass and miscanthus, are herbaceous perennial crops. And then you have poplar and willow. So this is where willow fits in. This is the context for the work that has been going on here for 30 years at ESF. Willow has the potential to produce somewhere around 65 million dry tons, I would say, and I worked on this portion of the report that they underestimated, but that's, we can have that discussion another time. This is a substantial amount of biomass across the landscape. So what I want to do now is shift and just talk about the work that's gone on here for a considerable amount of time on willow. But that's the context. It's a potential source of biomass that could feed into this idea that we want to grow out the biomass industry in the United States to somewhere around this billion tons of sustainable biomass. There's work in other parts of the world on willow as well. I won't spend time on that. I'm really just going to focus on telling some of the stories uh, and what we've discovered here at ESF. So Willow's got a long history in the region. The Native Americans of the region were certainly aware of the characteristics and the beneficial attributes of Willow. They used them in lots of different uh, applications uh, in, in their regular livelihoods. So some of those things and attributes that I'll talk about are not new things that we've discovered, right? The things that we've uh, repurposed or reapplied. Another interesting thing in the region is that in the mid-1800s, immigrants coming from Europe started bringing particular varieties or cultivars of willow with them when they came to North America. There was a basket industry. Many baskets in Europe were built uh, using willow. And so they brought varieties they were used to working with and started planting here in the landscape. This diagram from an early 1900s publication shows you where willow industry was, the light gray area. 
And then the darker gray area shows you where they uh, determined that there was a concentration of willow basket industry. Onondaga County was the center, the heart of the willow basket industry at the turn of the 1900s. Over 320,000 baskets a year were being made from willow. You can find willow on the landscape that was planted for the basket industry still out there in central New York. There's a patch in Casanova. You can find varieties that were brought from Europe on stream sides and road sides across the region. So there's a long history here uh, of willow being a part of both the economy uh, and being used for a variety of applications. So considerable time later, in the mid-1980s, willow research started here at ESF. Ed White and Larry Abrahamson, who are here tonight, launched this in 1986. It started with a small trial down in Tully, New York. The work that was launched there has now been going on for over 30 years. And there's a whole host of things that have been uh, researched and discovered. Here's a short list of things. And it's certainly not possible to touch on all of these items uh, in the next few minutes that we have together this evening. I do want to talk about a few things, but first I thought explaining to folks what the willow production cycle is. So I think when Ed and Larry started this back in 1986, they weren't entirely sure how a system might work or function. Right? This has been a process. Now, I will say that the Swedes have been doing it since the mid-1970s, so we have colleagues there that we're able to learn from. People up in Canada had been doing it for a few years before it started here. There's been lots of interaction around the world. I have frequent interactions now with people from Poland. It's a growing industry uh, in that part of the world. So this is where the system stands now. If we continue to build out this system and do research on it, it's going to change. It'll be different <clears throat> in a decade from now than it is at this point in time. We continue to learn and evolve. We're still at the front ends of the stage of really ironing this out. But here's what we do now. We take marginal agricultural land. Right? And you prepare it. You've got to control the weeds, prepare the soil so you can plant. I'll show you some blow-ups of these pictures uh, in a minute so they make a little more sense and are a little clearer. Then you plant it, you grow it for a year, and then you cut it down. So one of the things about the shrub willow we work with that's an interesting characteristic is if you cut it down, it sprouts back again. And so we work with that early on here. After planting, you may get one or two stems on a plant. After you coppice it or cut it back after the first year, you'll get eight or, ten stem, eight or 10 stems on a plant. It looks much more like a bush. And there's really some beneficial attributes. Most importantly, it increases your yield production on, uh, on your fields. Then you move into a cycle here. So you grow it typically for three or four years. And then it's time to harvest it. You go in and cut it off. And I'll talk about this in a little more detail in a minute. It sprouts again the next spring. You grow it for another three or four years, harvest it again. You can go seven times at least around this cycle. So you plant it once, and it's in the ground for somewhere between 20 and 25 years. It's a perennial crop on the landscape. Here's some close-up pictures. Uh, here's the planting system. This is a mechanized planter. The way you plant willow is you plant pieces of stems. So this planter takes one-year-old one year old stems, cuts off about an eight-inch section, and pushes it into the ground as you drive it across the field. Here's what a cutting, that piece of stem is called a cutting. Here's what it looks like. So you may have half an inch above ground, and most of that material is below ground. It roots below ground. It puts up some shoots above ground. And if you manage the system properly, you're up and away. Here's a field that's maybe four or five weeks old. This is maybe a month and a half or so old. One of the things that I just want to point out here is that you have to figure out how to work with the equipment that you're going to put into this system repeatedly. Hence, we have this double row system, two rows close together, a wider gap here. So think about when I show you pictures of tractors or harvesters moving through here, you straddle that double row. Right? If it's going to be there for multiple rotations, you can't be driving over top of these plants. That's why this system is designed this way, is to allow access uh, and to make, the, make it a manageable system. Here's re-sprouting willow after that first year. You can see here the red stems on these plants. So you have multiple of these red stems on each individual plant. Right? It's coming back more like a bush. It increases your leaf area. It increases your growth rate. There's lots of benefits. Willow grows quickly, right? five to 10 feet uh, easily in a year. If you go look at the material, <clears throat> 
here in front of Moon Library, for example, that material was cut down last winter. That's one year above ground growth. It's, it's seven or eight feet tall already, and it's not done growing. You can look at the tips, and it's still producing uh, new green leaves. Well, maybe not after the next few days, but it was up until the beginning of the week. It grows very quickly, which is really beneficial. Here's three-year-old willow. This is impressive stuff. There's a lot of wood per acre in this field. Okay? It maintains this characteristics of multiple stems on a plant, right? And it carries that through the system. You'll cut it, it'll sprout back again, it'll grow again. So after three years, it's time to cut it. <clears throat> Here's the harvesting system. I'll show you a video clip of this in a minute. Uh, but you cut it and then send the chips off to an end user uh, who can use it to produce renewable energy, biofuels, or other products. This is a facility in northern New York that uses wood chips to produce renewable electricity. So after that harvest, again, it comes back. This is regrowing willow, and you back into the next cycle, and you can do that for seven cycles over time. Okay, so that's the basic production system where it stands now. I just want to talk about a few of the attributes associated with. One is yield. As I mentioned before, yield is an essential uh, component of this system. You need to improve your yield, to improve your economics. It makes an impact on the sustainability of the system in terms of metrics like greenhouse gas emissions that I'll talk about later. And so I just want to talk about this for a few minutes. This is an example of a yield trial <clears throat> that's actually up in Middlebury, Vermont in collaboration with Middlebury College. So this is the yield trial here. These are some strip fertilizer trials that we'll put in alongside of it. <clears throat> you can see the little blocks through this picture. Some of these varieties did not do so well, right? So that's part of the testing system. There's 30 varieties in this trial. You know, if we come out of this trial, we came out of this trial with five or eight varieties that really did well, we'd be happy with that kind of a selection pressure. Yield uh, trials were then scattered over the decades across the landscape. Over the 30 or so years that work's been done on it, there's well over 30 yield trials that have been set up with collaborators across the United States and Canada. That sounds like a lot. When I stopped and started thinking about it for this lecture, I, it, it's mind-boggling how many thousands and thousands of hours have gone into those 30 yield trials. I'm going to show you some results from that. We are just at the base point of having enough data to start looking at patterns across the landscape. It takes a long time to get these data sets together. We've been very fortunate to be able to get support and funding to main these, maintain these kinds of trials over long periods of time. The first thing I want to talk about out of these yield trials is this long-term production issue. So I told you a few minutes ago that you can harvest this stuff seven times, right? Every three years, every four years, cut it, it'll sprout again, cut it, it'll sprout again. Just believe me. So here, we actually have data, finally. Again, this is not easy data to get. To keep a trial in the ground and maintain some source of funding for the length of time that this trial has been in the ground uh, is very rare. There's one or two that I know of in Europe. There's no other ones like this in the United States. It's a unique opportunity. So what we have here is relative yield. So what we did is we took yield in the first rotation and just normalized it to 100. Because what I really want to show you here is the patterns over time. And here's the rotations, 1 through 7. This is for willow cultivar SV1. When this trial went in the ground in 1993, there were 19 cultivars in this trial. There's one cultivar out of that trial that's still produced in our with our commercial nursery partner, and it's SB1. So that's why I'm showing you this data. The pattern's not that different for other ones, except for cultivars that failed totally over time. And there were a few of those that got impacted by some pests. But what you see here is this increase over the first four uh, rotations. There's a little bit of a drop. And then there's a bit of a drop off here in rotation six and seven. But if you note, we're at 125%, 25% of what we had in the first rotation. We're able to maintain high levels of production in these systems over these seven rotations. Now, our colleagues in Sweden that we continue to interact with say 10. Do it for 10, right? They're a decade ahead of us. Maybe we'll be fortunate enough to be able to track this through another three rotations. It's important to have information that you can touch and feel in my mind because this gets put into all sorts of models, right? And if you don't have this information, somebody's making it up and putting it into a model. Think about that projection I showed you from the DOE that ran out to 2040. If we don't really know we can grow these things for seven rotations, we're just throwing assumptions into a model. Breeding is important. 
The breeding program here at ESF started in the mid-1990s and continues to carry on with Larry Smart at Cornell. But this is really important, and there's huge opportunities here. There's about 175 species of shrub willow around the world. There's probably, between the breeding programs in Canada, the United States, and Europe that have gone on uh, over the years, there's probably only 25 or 30 species of willow that have ever been put into that system in terms of breeding. The genetic potential is large. We're just beginning to scratch the surface. So what does this tell us? Here's numbers in yield, megagrams per hectare per year. And what we compare here is data from pre-2005. So any yield trials we put in the ground before 2005 had what we call old cultivars. They are not from the breeding program that occurred here. They're largely unimproved uh, varieties. The red bars show you from a network of yield trials what the kind of results we were getting from new varieties right, that, had been, that had gone through the breeding program here in New York and been selected for high yield as well as other attributes. So if you picked your top cultivar, you get a 13% increase in yield. But you do not want to plant hundreds and hundreds or thousands of acres of one cultivar of a crop that's going to be in the ground for 20 or 25 years. You, you have very little resilience built into your system you're asking for some disaster to occur. So our recommendation would be you should really be planting more like five different cultivars. And they should be genetically different from one another. So if we look at that, the difference between the top five cultivars prior to breeding occurring and after the breeding program started is a yield difference of 35%. Right? Substantial gains to be made here uh, with genetics. And this is just traditional breeding uh, up to this point in time. So the potential going forward remains to be large uh, for more yield increases and improving the production of these systems. This is something else that comes out of these large uh, sets of data that you can amass over time. This is a regional yield map. We took data from colleagues from all across the country that we collaborated with on yield trials and worked with these folks in the PRISM group at Oregon State University and built a regional yield model. Now, the DOE also did this for all the energy crops, and they did it in a standardized format, because this data then went into that DOE billion ton report that I showed you. That's how they built these projections going forward that we could produce 730 million dry tons of energy crops. It's based on the field data that comes from <clears throat> these willow trials and other energy crop trials, and then are built into these models. Okay? It's really important that we continue to get this information because you can build a model to say whatever you want. If you don't have enough data to base it on, then you get walking on thinner and thinner ice. So this is something that just came out recently. There's lots of <coughs> useful applications for this now, looking at uh, willow across the landscape at large regional scales. The final thing related to yield I want to mention <coughs> is this G by E, genetic by environment interaction, something that if you're going to work with different varieties of any plant is a question we have. So what happens if you take variety A and you put it at different sites, right? Does it give you the same yield? Does it express itself the same way? What happens if you change varieties on a given site? How do they respond? Will they respond differently? And then you put those two things together, and you look at this G by E, genetic by environment interaction. So what we have here is an environment score. So you can just think of this uh, as increasing site quality. Low site quality here on the left, high site quality on the right. Okay, and then we have uh, a normalized uh, yield number on the y-axis. Three main groups of varieties that come out of this. You have varieties that do reasonably well on low quality, uh, low quality sites. As you increase the quality, you increase the yield. Okay, that's what you might expect. You've got varieties that do reasonably well on low quality sites, and as you increase the, increase the quality of the site, they do worse. Right? Both of those together would be called plastic clones. They flex depending upon site conditions. You then have this cluster of varieties of cultivars here in the middle that are what we would call stable. Irregardless of the site conditions that you expose them to or plant them on, they pretty much are producing the same yield uh, across an area. So why is this important? It's important because if you're going to go out and plant a site, ideally you'd like to know what are your site conditions? And what varieties do I want to plant on that site? Right? It would make a huge di difference here if you went out and planted a cluster of varieties from the bottom at this site as opposed to the ones at the top. It would have all sorts of implications on the economics and the impacts of the system over time. Again, 
we are just at the bottom of having enough data to do this kind of analysis. The fellow who did this, Eric Fabio, right, and a bunch of us working together, worked hard to make the statistics work. We're getting to the point of having enough data. There's a lot more that we can do, uh, and it will have an impact on yield and how the system would get deployed across the landscape. As the Willow system developed, I want to shift gears now away from yield and talk about this other thing about scaling up the system. Shortly after, uh, I think Ed and Larry discovered that Willow actually grew as fast as the people in Sweden said it did, right? You start doing that, and you start thinking about, okay, so what, what might we be able to do with this stuff? And it's always been a goal, as long as I've been involved in the program and when I started, to facilitate commercialization or deployment of this crop across the landscape. So a lot of the work that has been done has been to address questions to hopefully uh, allow the crop to move out across the landscape. There were some initial efforts to do that with a Department of Energy grant in the early 1990s out in western New York. I'm not going to get into that story. Ask uh, Larry and Ed if you want, and they'll happily tell you about it. Uh, lots of lessons learned out of that. The latest round of this was in uh, 2012. So the USDA has this biomass crop assistance program. This is really a program that gives some incentive funding to landowners to start growing energy crops. These are new crops to them. They're not familiar. There's risk associated with them. And so the USDA had a program to buy down the risk for landowners. ESF worked together with uh, partners at ReEnergy and Celtic Energy Farms and a couple of organizations and put together an application package. And USDA said, they liked the idea, and they funded it. And that funding went to landowners, and there's now 1,200 acres here in northern New York. So in these three counties, you can see where the fields are in green, and then these two end-use facilities. ReEnergy was a key partner in this, and they didn't need to uh, step up and do this, but they signed 11-year contracts with landowners to buy all the willow. Not that landowners had to sell it to them, but they committed to buying all the willow if that's the market they wanted to sell it into. That gave landowners some security that there was going to be a market out there because a lot of people had not worked with willow and were not familiar with it. We've done other things. We've worked with a commercial nursery here, uh, Dennis Rack, out of AA Willow, right? So material that comes out of the breeding program goes to Dennis. He scales it up. Uh, Dennis would be happy if you called and wanted to order a few hundred. He'd be really happy if you called and wanted to order a million cuttings, and he could produce those for you. So having a commercial partner that can do that scale up rapidly is really important. Universities don't do that well. Commercial partners are great to have in the system. Here's what the situation was at ReEnergy before they got engaged with BCAP. So this was some of the first truckloads of willow that we delivered to ReEnergy. They were interested in the idea, but they said, huh, willow, most people think of willow, <clears throat> you're not going to go out and cut firewood from a willow tree, right? It's low density, it's stringy, it's often perceived to be wetter, it's no wetter than any other hardwood, frankly, but that's the perception. So what did ReEnergy do when we delivered uh, wood chips? Piled them off to the side. They didn't want them on their pile. The people at the plant were skeptical about them. And they started mixing them in with their wood chip supply into their facility that produces renewable electricity. You know, after they started trying it, they came back and said, OK, so tell us what, what do you got in that willow? Because our boiler works a little better. It burns a little cleaner. And I'm going, I, I, I'm not quite sure why your boiler is doing nice things for you. But they said, this is great. And then they made this commitment to buy all the willow that was going to be produced. So this is part of the growing experience, right, and engaging with different parts of the system to make it all move forward. There's a market. ReEnergy will make use of this material. They put it into their system on a regular basis. They're happy with it. They've now used over 7,500 tons of willow in the last few years from the acreage in northern New York. So if you put willow out across the landscape, one might think you want to have a way to harvest it. So on a smaller side, and I, I'll try not to go too far down this road, but when, when this program, the DOE, started in western New York, and I remember I was out talking to landowners, convincing them to put willow in the ground, truth to be told, we had no way to harvest it. <laughs> and so when you have two or 300 acres of willow, and the best you've done so far is with a brush saw by hand, it's mildly daunting. So here was our first stab at it. Uh, we brought a piece of equipment that attaches to a tractor, so this harvester over here. Right? Wonderful idea. Worked in Sweden. Amazing. When it got here, didn't work. 
at all. We had engineers, the ag engineers from Cornell working with us. They tinkered with it. They played with it. I don't think we cut more than 25 or 30 acres with that piece of equipment. It, it didn't work. So we got a problem there. Here was the first run here. So sometime around 2004, 2005, I got a phone call from New Holland Agriculture, right? Makes lots of big agriculture equipment. And they said, hey, we're interested in trying to see if our forge chopper will cut wood. You got any willow? I'm going, we got willow. <laughs> They've got a machine. I said, you bring your machine, I'll line you up with willow. So they did that. Here's the machine they brought up, a forge chopper. This is a corn head, not a good idea. Right? This corn head was no more after about five acres. But the folks in New Holland were ecstatic, right? Because they discovered that a machine that was built to chop corn and grass, this forage chopper, could chop wood. And it could do so consistently, reliably, and they didn't see it was going to be a long-term wear and tear issue on their equipment. So let me just show you a little video of this, because this is something we've been working on for a number of years, and it's kind of it's kind of cool. Uh, frankly, to see that it actually works. So there's been a lot of stages of development, but here's where we're at with this piece of equipment. This is a standard New Holland forage harvester. They sell these typically to chop corn for silage or chop grass for haylage. Okay? That's what they're sold for. They're, they're called forage choppers. You don't do anything inside this machine to change it to chop willow. The key is you've got to find a way to cut willow. Remember, corn heads don't work, right? Willow's a little tougher than corn. It's this piece out here on the front side, okay? the header that you snap on the front of the machine. There's long stories, interesting stories about that. But in essence, over time, New Holland committed to designing and building these headers. Right? This is their design. You can call a New Holland dealer should you decide that you want a coppice header for your forage harvester, and they'll sell you one. Right? Great opportunity to work with a large company. That, that is very hard to bring something through to that stage of commercialization where there's a network of dealers that are out there that can deal with it. This was a, a wonderful partnership and continues to be a wonderful partnership. There are two of these harvesters here in New York. Here's another part of the wonderful partnership. New Holland donated this forage harvester to the college. Right? We've been able to do fascinating things in terms of research and help landowners figure out how to drive down harvesting costs and improve harvesting fishy efficiency because New Holland donated one of these pieces of equipment. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars that we didn't have to go out and somehow figure out how to buy. Basically, this machine is doing, as you can see, what it's called what we call a cut and chip, single pass cut and chip operation. It's got big saw blades. It cuts it at the front end, pulls the stems in, runs it through a set of uh, drum chippers inside, and blows chips out the side. Okay? And it works reliably. Should you decide that uh, you want to do other things, you can do other things with your forage hopper, uh, chopper. So here's uh, items from New Holland's advertising material for their forage chopper. Here's a corn head. You can snap your corn head on your forage chopper. Right? When you're done with corn season, take it off, snap on your woody coppice head, and go cut your willow or your poplar or your eucalyptus or your locust. They've used it in all those kinds of woody crops. Right? Here's another advertisement. Here's where I think uh, the marker is, how you know you've made it. When your piece of equipment makes it into the farm simulation game marketplace, right? So this is from some farm simulation game. And here's the option to go buy a New Holland 130 FB coppice header. And you can play with it on your simulated farm, right? You can grow your simulated energy crop and figure out and play how it's going to work in your system. So, I saw this, I thought, wow, we've really reached some level of acceptance in the world because the gamers have actually built a dedicated coppice header. Lots of other benefits associated with willow, far too much to talk about. There's lots of work that's been done on wildlife and water quality and reducing soil erosion potential and other attributes associated with willow across the landscape. I do want to highlight this one piece greenhouse gas emissions, because it's an important number to understand and to be able to project forward if we scale up energy crops, whether we can really help address climate change or not. So here's some results. Uh, this paper is in its second round of review. It will hopefully be out soon. A PhD student that graduated last year. What do we have here? We've got greenhouse gas emissions in kilograms of CO2 equivalent per ton of willow. This analysis goes all the way from putting uh, 
studying the prepare the soil to plant willow through seven rotations, <clears throat> and then removing the plants after those seven rotations, after you take that last harvest off. So it's called, it's a life cycle analysis, and it covers the whole entire lifespan of the crop. I've got two crop types here. This is, this is a point of uh, debate and discussion uh, in the academic world and how you do these numbers, so I wanted to present this. If you had land that had been in an annual cropping system, say for the 10 years before you put willow in, you're going to typically have a lower soil carbon content. If you put willow in, you should accumulate. It's a perennial plant. You should build up and reaccumulate carbon in the soil. If you take something that's been in grassland or some sort of permanent cover, right, and then convert it to willow, the models will tell you that you're going to lose soil carbon. Okay, so that's data that you put into a century. It's called the century model, and it spits out soil carbon numbers. We don't have good data on this, right? It's hard to track soil carbon over long periods of time. That's what the models tell us. It would sure be nice to try and be able to get a better handle on this. I'm not convinced that we're having this impact with grassland. But here's where the numbers stand based on the best information we have. So what is this telling us? So if we take cropland here, here's all the positive greenhouse gas emissions associated with this system. They're related uh, to um, different attributes. Uh, that are going on. So harvesting, fertilizer, fertilizer somehow disappeared off the bottom of my chart. That's why I'm stumped, but that's what it is. This is fertilizer, emissions associated with nitrogen fertilizer, right? Harvesting uh, systems and other components. Think about fossil fuels that can put into equipment uh, that are used to make fertilizer. Those are all positive greenhouse gas emissions. At the bottom end of the component here, you have things that are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So in the cropland case, we're building soil carbon. Oh, and Willow's got this whole root system below ground, right? We talk about the above ground part, uh, and we spend time working on that, and it's relatively easy to measure. Trust me, I, I've had a few students, they get excited about doing root work, and in very short order, they discover it's not that exciting. It's a lot of digging, a lot of tedious work. It's hard to get those numbers. We've done that on a several sites now. We have probably some of the best numbers out there in the world. So this is the below ground piece because the plant's storing carbon in its, not its fine roots, but its larger coarse roots below ground. Here's the same numbers for grassland. So if you take all the numbers here and add them up, the positives and the negatives, this is where you end out. That's what the yellow line is. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that willow grown on cropland has a negative greenhouse gas emissions. We're producing wood that can be used for biofuels or renewable energy and actually taking a little bit of CO2 out of the atmosphere. Now, if you grow it on grassland, it's a little bit positive. These numbers aren't easy to get a handle on, right, if you don't work with them all the time, so I did some calculations. If we took this willow with these footprints here or here in terms of a greenhouse gas emissions footprint, put them into the re-energy facility and produced electricity, what would the greenhouse gas footprint be? Somewhere between 30 and a little over 100 grams of CO2 <clears throat> per kilowatt hour of electricity produced. So what is it for coal? It's about 1,000. What is it for natural gas? It's about 500. So willow's a low carbon fuel at best, right? Maybe it's carbon neutral. We can debate about that, right? But we can make substantial progress. And um, producing electricity from willow is probably one of the lowest efficiency conversion systems. But those are easy numbers, I think, easier numbers to wrap our head around. So huge greenhouse gas benefits. Go back to those 450 million tons that I told you that the DOE projected, projected we could save, right, if we put a billion tons on the landscape. It's based on these kind of calculations. Okay, we've looked at this across the landscape. So here's uh, for the fields, the areas where fields are in northern New York, transportation distance has a big impact on this. It's moving biomass long distances is problematic. The further you get away, the larger uh, you grow your greenhouse gas footprint. So, just thinking about how you design these systems and the haul distances associated with them, it's important to think about the carbon footprint and what the impact might be. One other metric that people like to talk about is EROI, energy return on investment. So what is that? For every unit of fossil fuel we invest in the system, think the diesel in the harvester. Think the energy, the fossil energy it takes to make that equipment or the en fossil energy it takes to make the fertilizer. We invest fossil energy. What this tells us is that for every unit of fossil energy invested, excuse me, we get 15 to 40 units 
of energy out in wood chips, right? So are we violating basic thermodynamics? No, we're not creating energy. What is it? This is the sun's energy, right? I told you at the beginning, you can think about willow or biomass as this battery on the landscape. That's it right there. There's the numbers, right? We're gathering the sun's energy, right? We're investing a little bit of fossil fuel, and we're producing wood chips, stored chemical energy that we can use for other attributes. Okay, in the last few minutes, I want to shift gears. So we spent many years, many people working on willow, right? <clears throat> and we learned a lot about shrub willow. And as we went along, people started thinking about other ways we can apply that across the landscape. And there's lots of opportunities to do that. These are systems that I'm going to talk about where the primary application is not to produce biomass for renewable energy, is to produce some other service, right? I like to call them multifunctional systems. You could harvest them for biomass as well, but that's not the primary reason they're there on the landscape. I want to just talk about two examples, living snow fences and remediation of an industrial site. Here it is, upstate New York. Maybe not tonight, but certainly in a month or two, right? Blowing snow across the highway. It's a serious problem. It's a serious cost, right? We spend several billion dollars in the United States clearing snow off highways, $300 million in New York alone. It costs 100 times more to plow snow off a road than it is to set up a snow fence and block it on the side of the road and not have it blow on the road in the first place. You know, I look at those numbers. This is from a National Highway Service Department, and I think, why aren't we doing this all over the place? Well, there's all sorts of social barriers to implementing these kind of things, but there's real potential, and there's lots of other benefits associated with here. How does this work? You've seen plastic snow fences on the roadside, right? Those plastic snow fences they set up, it's really the same principle. The idea here is you have wind blowing, it picks up snow. The amount of snow it picks up depends upon how much space you have here, how fast the wind is going, how wet the snow is, and a couple other factors, but those are the main ones. If you can slow this wind down with some sort of a barrier, a plastic snow fence, uh, a set of trees, or something else, you slow the, the wind speed down, it drops the snow out. The key here is you don't want to be dropping the snow out here on the highway. That's not helping anybody that's making the situation potentially worse. Here's the guideline. It's hard to read probably. 35 times the height of the fence. This is work that was done on these standard small snow fences. People then applied it to trees. If you have a 20-foot tree here, that's 700 feet from the side of the road. Nobody has a 700-foot right away. And so people said, oh, these living snow fences are never going to work. You can't put them close enough to the road. Well, the reality is those numbers uh, were not accurate for living snow fences. Why willow? It's the same attributes. It grows quickly. The other thing that's unique about it, here's a picture of willow uh, in the wintertime where we're measuring the density. The density of willow is about 40 to 60% in the wintertime. That plastic snow fence on the side of Rome is designed with 50% density, 50% open space. Willow fits right in that same space in terms of its density. It, it has a lot of those sort of attributes that make it relatively easy to work with. And it's low cost. Remember, we put these little cuttings in the ground. It's not a rooted plant. It's not a tree with a big root ball at the bottom that costs $20 or $30, right? Depending on how many you buy from Dennis, you can get them for 10 cents a cutting. Okay, drift length. So it's important. It was important to understand this drift length issue. Okay, so this is a little uh, complicated maybe, but I'll, let me just explain it briefly. Transportation ratio, the amount of snow that can be blown across the landscape at a given site. So each of these dots represents a different place in New York State where there was a living snow fence. <clears throat> the blue ones are willow, the green ones are conifers, then there was a honeysuckle one and something else out there. That is fixed. The amount of snow blowing across the landscape is fixed, right? Unless you make some dramatic change, clear some forest, or do something, that's fixed. You've got a transportation ratio. You can change the capacity. You can change the amount of snow that a living snow fence can trap and hold. How do you do that? Well, a couple of ways. Grow it taller, right? Change the optical porosity or the density. That's going to change the wind dynamics. Out of this graph, right? The key here is that we determine what is the downward drift length for the characteristics of these snow fences. And you can see here, once you get your capacity transportation ratio up here, it's less than 10 meters. You can put these snow fences, and they can capture all the snow that you need 15, 20 feet off the side of the road. Okay? That's what that's telling us. 
There's lots of right-of-ways out there that are 15 to 20 feet wide. There's lots of opportunities to apply this across the landscape, right? Those old numbers based on structural snow fences do not apply to trees. Here it is, it works. So this is snow fence, a uh, willow snow fence south of Preble on 81 South uh, that was put in a number of years ago. There was some issues with variety choices, so we're having some issues with it. But this is three years old. Here's the snow drift. Here's the highway. It's got a lot more capacity to store a lot more snow, right, than there's even there now. And there's still height capacity. That drift will grow up more than it will grow out. Okay? So we can make these systems work. It takes a little bit of understanding and, and working with it to figure out. There's lots of people in the DOT, uh, road engineers, that don't like plants because they're not predictable, right? You can't tell me that willow is 50% density. It's between 40 and 60%. How am I going to put that into my model, right? Well, just work with us, right? Let's be flexible here. Let's, it's been a process, but it's being deployed in various places. Uh, around New York, out in Minnesota, Wisconsin's doing it now, so it's happening in other places as well. Okay, the final thing. Uh, in the last couple of minutes here is to talk about this issue of remediation of industrial sites. And so this is a snapshot that shows you uh, sites where, where biomass could be grown across the country. This is a study that the EPA and the National Renewable Energy Lab did. There's a lot of dots on that map. There are tens of thousands, there's hundreds of thousands of acres of industrial land across the landscape that we could be growing biomass on. Oh, and at the same time, we could be addressing environmental concerns with those former industrial sites, okay? Look here in the Northeast. Think about that map I showed you where willow grows well, right? There's a lot of former industrial sites that we do something with. So let me tell you a story about, briefly, about one site here in Syracuse. So the Solve Settling Basins on the west side of Onondaga Lake. We produced soda ash here for about 100 years from the late 1800s to the early, till the 1980s. Right? Uh, and it was a product that went into lots of different things. But for every ton of soda ash that was produced, there was roughly a ton of waste material that was produced. And it had to go somewhere. As well, it's all over the place. This is all solve waste. These are all settling basins. The mall's built on this stuff. If you go up to where the new parking area is and look over those white cliffs there, that's not really soil. That's solve waste. Okay? We're working on these waste beds out here. Now, what is salve waste? It's really salt, right? That's all it is, is salt, because the, the way the process worked, the byproduct that came out was salt. So it's no more, it's not something that's really highly toxic, except you don't want to be eating lots of salt, right? The challenge with this stuff is that it's piled up 30 to 45 feet deep out there. Water moves down through it, and it's going to carry those salts. It carries the salts out into Nine Mile Creek, which then carries salts out into the lake. So it's having an impact on the environment. There's no doubt about that. So we've got to do something and look at some alternatives to try and address that. Here's a couple of goals. So Honeywell is now the responsible party. They bought Allied Signal 15 or 20 years ago. Allied Signal had bought out Solve chemicals decades ago, right? So Honeywell, because they bought Allied Signal as a responsible party, they never made soda ash there, but they're the ones that have it because of that purchase. Here's the two goals. The first goal is to reduce environmental impact associated with this site, right? Protect human health and the environment. The second thing is to turn this 700 acres of these settling basins into a productive community asset. Let's produce renewable energy. Let's enhance wildlife habitat. Oh, maybe we could create trails and things for people to go through once we've got a system that works up there. Here's what the system looks like uh, without a lot of plants going on it, which is its typical condition up there, right? Here's the solve waste that's piled up, not a lot of vegetation on it or it's sparse. And what do we have? Well, we got precipitation coming in, right? And that water goes somewhere. There's only a limited number of places that it can go. It can go back into the atmosphere through evaporation or up through plants, transpiration, right? Here's the evapotranspiration. Uh, it can do overland flow or runoff. This is relatively flat up there because it's settling basins. The way it was um, built out is not a lot of overland runoff. You can change the soil moisture holding or the substrate moisture holding capacity and store some water in there. Or it's going to infiltrate or percolate down through the system and ultimately into groundwater and off into the creek and the river. When you don't have plants out there, ET is small. Here's the vision. If we could get willow to grow out there, willow is an inefficient user of water. I've showed you how fast it grows. For every kilogram or pound of wood that willow grows, it uses a fair amount of water. We could dramatically change the amount of evapotranspiration 
dramatically decrease the amount of infiltration. If we could manage the water budget, we could begin to address these salts that are leaching out the bottom of this into groundwater and surrounding surface waters. Okay, we've got to do some things. We, we're going to have to add some organic amendments up here. That's what the brown is. Lots of the attributes I've talked about in terms of willow apply here as well. It's fast growth. It's fibrous root system. This is one that's interesting. Right? It's got a long growing season, right? The willows in front of Moon Library still have green leaves on it. They're still transpiring when it's warm enough during the daytime, pumping water. Here's the challenge. So here's Al Abuzz, who was the site manager at the time. Doug Daly's there, a few of us others. This, Al brought us up to this site, and he said, here's the challenge. Can you get willow to grow on this? They hadn't put anything on this site in terms of waste products for 20 or 25 years before we got there. I can tell you, I'm standing there looking at it going, you're kidding me, right? There are no plants here. Oh, no, there is. Look, there's willow. Oh, and if you look here, there's a little bit of birch and some willow growing here, right? But it was like, that's the challenge. If you guys can make willow grow here and balance the water budget, we could create an alternative cap up here and address this concern. Okay, this isn't soil. This is substrate. It's really challenging. It's not an environment that plants really want to grow in. So we took a phased approach, start small. Right? We went up there, dug up some of this uh, material, brought it back to a greenhouse, set up greenhouse trials. We tested 40 different varieties, hoping that somewhere in this mix of varieties that we had, there was going to be one that was going to work. Well, lo and behold, there were some that worked. Right? We then went on and did some other greenhouse trials, testing different organic amendments, right? and then went on and started doing things in the field. So let me just show you a little bit of that story. So here's an organic amendment trial in the greenhouse. So here we have different organic amendments. Part of the goal here was to take a local waste product, organic waste product, and use it in a beneficial application on the solvay settling basin. So instead of it getting thrown away, take it as a beneficial product, mix it into the site, grow willow. So we tried material from the Anheuser-Busch, Bristol-Myers Squibb. This stuff was really great, but the wastewater treatment plan is not functional. Metro biosolids, here's solvay material. So first thing is, uh, it doesn't work well with straight solving material, right? We kind of knew that by standing up there, but you put these into tests as a control. There are certain organic amendments that work well, okay? There are certain cultivars that do better than others. And I just wanted to highlight this because this is a, a little lesson we learned. Here's this SB1 cultivar I talked about before. In the greenhouse, in these trials, it did gangbusters. We're going, we're liking this, right? There's potential here. We know about this cultivar. It was in the original ply, uh, trials that Larry and Ed put in. Been around a long time. We then went to the field. So you take your results from the greenhouse, you pick your best cultivars and the amendments that you think are going to work, and you go do it in the field. Here's our yield trial, those similar kind of blocks. Right? You'll note there's some holes here. I'm here to tell you some of those holes are SB1. So it did great in the greenhouse when you watered it and controlled the temperature. You, you put it out in that environment, and you hit a drought period, and it just it gave up the ghost, right? It was not going to survive out there. So you're back to having to look for new varieties to make this system work. Do organic amendments, are they important? Yeah, we showed that in the greenhouse. Here's the non-amended willow plots out here on the settling basin. Do you see any willow out there? No. It doesn't work, right? But that was just to prove to Honeywell that they needed to spend some money to bring in some organic amendments. Well, the other thing to note here is look at the other woody plants out here that are on the landscape, right? They've all dropped their leaves. This stuff is still green. The leaf area index, the amount of foliage left here is still substantial. They continue to pump water well into the fall. That's really helpful for managing the water budget. Okay, this is just some data, yield data, different varieties from this field trial. Just wanted to make this point again. So what works in the greenhouse doesn't always work in the field. You want to step these things out in a logical fashion or you get yourself into real trouble. If we'd scaled up 10 or 20 or 30 acres with SV1 because it worked great in the greenhouse, it would have been a great embarrassment, right? Lots of other work goes on over the years, right? And people have been engaged and involved with this, right? Measuring growth and water budget attributes and then putting this data into a water budget model that Doug Daly and his students worked with, basically able to show that we can manage the water budget up there with Willow, which means we can minimize and almost reduce the amount of salts that are moving out of the system and into the environment. Oh, and let's think about, we can also harvest this and produce renewable energy up at this site. 
Here's our first scale up. Remember that white uh, picture of white stuff that I showed you? Here it is. That was the challenge. This is an organic amendment trial we put in. Here we are, we're still playing with organic amendments. You can see the different colors, right? We still had two different amendments we're trying, and we tried different rates on this side and this side. We continue now, after having 100 acres put out in the landscape, we're continuing to play with it. This system is not set. This is a challenging environment. It's hard to understand, but we're making the system work. Here's where we stand now. There's about 100 acres of willow up here. There's uh, acreage, somewhere around five or 600 acres here of these settling basins that still need to be uh, covered. It's going through a review process right now with the DEC and whether they find this an acceptable way to address the environmental concerns associated with this site. The last thing is this idea of producing renewable energy. So we can harvest that willow off. That's the way we modeled it in the water budget. What we'd really like to do is to take the willow off of Solve. Now we've got to go and pelletize it. In the basement of this building is a biomass combined heat and power facility. We'd like to harvest that willow, uh, go to a, co a collaborator, make some pellets, and bring them here to the gateway and produce renewable heat and power and close the loop. And then take the ash out of that combined heat and power system that's left in the bottom and take those nutrients that are lacking out on this site and return them back out to the site and create this closed loop cycle here in Syracuse. Take those hundreds of acres of a former industrial site and make them productive. Lots of other opportunities for multifunctional systems, protecting water quality with buffers or nutrient filter strips, stream bank stabilization, odor control barriers, all sorts of things that we can apply the knowledge we've gained about willow uh, in different situations. So thank you for your attention. Uh, here's sort of the summary. So biomass is important. It's 50% of our renewable energy now. It's going to be an important part of addressing climate change issues going forward. The amount of biomass that we use in our energy system here in the United States and around the world needs to grow. We have learned lots in 30 years. The other way I look at this is we are just beginning to scratch the surface on the information we need to really understand and optimize these kinds of systems. There's lots more that can be done and hopefully we get the opportunity to do that. I would be remiss to not mention that this is not done alone, right? Numerous organizations, companies, uh, and other organizations that have partnered with us over the decades to do this work. This is not work uh, that's done by individuals. It's done by collaboration. Universities across the United States and Europe and Canada have been involved and collaborated with us and us with them on this kind of work. And finally, I need to acknowledge funding uh, agencies over the years. So we have had funding from state and federal agencies, private companies, large and small. And Packaging all that together is what has allowed this work to go on for over three decades. Hopefully we'll be able to continue to do that and continue to build the data set and continue to help deploy Willow across the landscape. Oh, and just in case you didn't know, working with Willow is fun, right? See that? There's excitement level involved in that. Okay, I'm happy to take questions, Chris, if we have a few minutes to do that. Thank you very much for your attention. and going from, I guess, nine months to year-round, is that going to increase demand for what we're doing with Will? So currently, uh, there's very little ethanol made from dedicated energy crops. It, it's called cellulosic ethanol uh, because of the cellulose that's in plants, the sugars that we can convert it to ethanol. Almost all the ethanol we're coming is from corn and starch at this point in time. I don't think a 5% increase in our usage of ethanol is going to be enough to drive the cellulosic ethanol market. What's happening with turning uh, willow or other energy crops into biofuels? The focus now is really on jet fuel uh, and marine fuels, diesel fuels, right? The ethanol market is here in the United States is pretty is saturated. Uh, and so people are looking at taking the sugars in energy crops and doing other transportation fuels at this point. You've heard about these flights that go on, right, with planes flying with biofuels. That's, those biofuels either made from algae 
or they're made from cellulose uh, material, energy product. So I have a, oh, I have a question about why only seven cycles for the whole process. Uh, does it just bring diminishing returns after those seven cycles? So that's a good question. So we're at seven cycles. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Our colleagues in Sweden would tell us they've gone to 10. They can say you can go to 10. One of the other challenges is after you cut willow, when it re-sprouts, it tends to sprout on the outer side of stems. So you start with something like this and it begins to spread a little bit. And so at some point, it's going to probably spread to a point that it's now going to start getting run over when you start running that harvester down. It's going to stick out into the space where the harvester runs, and you're going to start damaging your plant. So it's, it's probably more a mechanical spacing limitation than it is that the plant uh, can't continue to regenerate itself. If you knew of any of the other indigenous uses of willow, you mentioned there was kind of a variety of things. But other than baskets, did you know? Of so any? they used it a lot uh, for building materials. It's a fairly flexible plant, right? And so into structures where you needed flexible material that could built in. I know they used it in stabilizing stream banks, right? In areas where they wanted to minimize erosion, where they had settlements that was used for those kind of applications as well. context of like below ground carbon. Um, so when you go to plant it again, are the roots just filled into the soil or do you shift the rows over or what's so the strategy? So if you're going to, the, the numbers I showed you for below ground carbon are coarse roots, not fine roots. Fine roots, okay. the little root hairs turn over fairly quickly. So we don't think of those as a stored carbon pool. Right. Um, so those coarse roots, right. So if you were to plant willow following willow, what you would do is harvest it off probably spray off the re-sprouting material, and then move your double row over into the gap, right? You may grind off some of that top material, but you're not really going to want to tear those roots out of the system. Even when we've taken fields that we've rented over time and gone from willow back to a corn crop, for example, harvest it, spray off the sprouts, and then we grind it down just an inch or two into the soil. Willow will not, the willow we use does not sprout from the roots. It only sprouts from the above ground material, and so if you grind off that top, you can leave the roots in the system. And people have successfully put in corn following willow using that approach. Hi there. Uh, first of all, thank you. Very great presentation. Really loved it. Uh, the one question I had coming away from it was, um, so you plant a lot of this willow and it's obviously using a lot of the, the nutrients and minerals in, in the soil and you mentioned a little bit about uh, a lot of nitrogen based fertilizers that you put in the soil and I'm just wondering if you guys have in any way kind of looked at the environmental impact of utilizing those heavy nitrogen soils and if you're trying to look at any kind of crop rotation or kind of way of, of putting nitrogen back in the soil to try and limit that environmental impact as well. Yeah, so we've looked at a variety of different things. The amount of nitrogen you put on relative to other agricultural crops is, is relatively small. We put on 100 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare once every three years after harvest, right? So, I, you know, your corn rates vary around here, but it would not be abnormal to put on 75 to 125 kilograms of nitrogen every year on a corn crop. So it's considerably less, but the, probably the best approach that we've looked at is using organic amendments. Digested uh, dairy manure, uh, biosolids from wastewater treatment plants, these other organic waste streams, uh, we could use those as an organic amendment to supply the nutrients, right, and remove the commercial uh, mineral fertilizer uh, from the operation. That's, that's the easiest way to do that. There have been some discussions about trying to incorporate legumes into the system, but at the rate this grows, there's not enough light there down at the bottom to support another crop like a legume that would add nitrogen to the system. Thank you. Hopefully Tim is going to be around. We're going to have a reception after this that everyone's going to be invited to. But I just want to continue on with the program so we can uh, get to this. So based on this body of work, which is only a small part of the work that Dr. Volk has done, uh, 
it's very clear <coughs> to our community that he really exemplifies what it is to be an outstanding researcher within our community. And because of that, he was appointed and awarded the 2018-19 Exemplary Researcher for ESF. So I'd like to present him uh, with an acknowledgement of that uh, at this time. So if you would come with me. for your exemplary research uh, over the past 30 years, and we hope it continues for 30 years more. <laughs> and uh, My wife doesn't. <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll hope that you'll have a legacy. That <laughs> there you go. There. And uh, from this also, this will be uh, posted another plaque uh, within Gray Hall. So congratulations on this. Great. Thank and you very much. Secondary for being our... Dale Travis uh, uh, lecture speaker, uh, we also have this set of wood products <laughs> for ESF to give to you. Thank you very much. Uh, an acknowledgement of your great contribution with this, this speech today. Thank so you. Appreciate it. <laughs> so if you just indulge me for a couple more minutes, there's something I, I wanted to do here. So. I, I, I appreciate uh, the acknowledgement and the recognition. It, it's truly an honor to be recognized by your peers, but this doesn't happen in isolation, right? And so I really want to just make the point. It takes a team, right? And this should run through a set of pictures. I certainly couldn't find all of them, right? But over the years, there have been hundreds and hundreds of people that have done research, right? So I also just want to ask people in the audience, who's had some association with the Willow Project over the years? Right, you can put your hand up. Maybe you've worked in a lab or in the field or worked on a proposal or you've worked on uh, processing my quirky paperwork that I generate out of this project. Right? There's lots of people that have done this, right? that have helped media communications, connecting to other partners. So I appreciate being acknowledged and recognized, but I really want to make the point that this does not happen in isolation. This is not just my work. This is a team of people. There have been wonderful graduate students. I've had wonderful mentors over the years and colleagues. And so I just want to say that, that it's important to remember that uh, it, it occurs as a team, right? Not as an individual. I don't sit in my lab or down in the field doing this all on my own. Very little of it would get done if there weren't this team of people behind the scenes making all this happen. So I want to say thank you to all of you that are here or, or other folks that have contacted me if I had expressed that same thing. Uh, this has been successful because of your work and contribution over 30 years. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to uh, close the session, but also to invite all of you to the reception that's just outside the doors here. And uh, hopefully Tim will be around for a few more minutes. So if you have other questions, please feel free to join and mingle with us. Um, let's also thank the Travises again for sponsoring this lecture series. Uh, this is a great opportunity again for us to uh, express the incredible research that's done here at the college. So thank you again to Dale and Sigrid. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah.